folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We are dealing with Vatican secrets, things that the Vatican doesn't necessarily want people to know about. And they're not hard to find out if you read your Bible which is what we're going to do now. We've been looking at Revelation 17 and Revelation 18, dealing with a woman who is called, of all things, Mystery. That's her first name, Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Let's start with verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will shew unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. So we, we sort of get the idea already. We're not talking about a human woman necessarily. We're talking about a, a, a god that is a female. That would be a goddess. And I have some pictures of goddesses to show you in a little bit. Verse 2, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy. Boy, I tell you what, with what I already know we're going to be dealing with in this series, that verse fits very appropriately, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. Verse 6 is very important. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. We can sort of tell that this is not like one particular woman uh, necessarily out of the Bible like uh, Jezebel or Herodias who wanted the head of John the Baptist put on a charger and brought to her. Ooh. Uh, Jezebel who uh, ordered the killing of Elijah the prophet. I mean she was after blood. But rather Jezebel and Herodias and other women in the Bible are sort of portraying certain aspects of this particular female spirit. Okay. And in chapter 18, we found that wherever her spirit is, you're always going to find devils, evil, unclean spirits. Uh, the Bible mentions hateful birds. Uh, verse 1 of chapter 18, After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and it's become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Again, verse 3, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. There's always going to be, wherever this spirit is, wherever this goddess is, there's always going to be large amounts of money transferred in the name of her religion. Now think about that. That, that could apply to a lot of religions across the world. Okay? A lot of different religions. Uh, the merchandising in, in, in relation to religious things, whereby certain people get rich because they sell merchandise that's related to a certain religion, and 
by telling you that you must have this in order to be part of this religion. We found out that one of Paul's biggest enemies, the Apostle Paul, he mentioned Alexander the coppersmith was a furious enemy of Paul. He hated Paul's guts. Why? Because Paul said, uh, God is not made with hands. So whatever temple you go into and you see this big statue there, that's not God. That's not even what God is meant to be. In fact, God says, don't make any images of me or anything else in heaven or in the earth or in beneath the earth. And of course, Alexander the coppersmith was a man getting filthy rich off of making little gods that people bought or some sort of religious trinkets that they must have in order to pursue their particular religion. That's true of a lot. That's true of a lot of uh, big money, big name, so-called Christian ministries. They'll come up with some video or some book and say, it is imperative that you get this book, this revelation from God, God gave to me. I put it down and I've tried to uh, make it make sense out of it for you. And I, I've did all the work and you, you can have this now for just a gift of fifty nine dollars and ninety five cents plus twenty dollars shipping and handling. You can have it's a free, free gift to you as long as you give us, you know, 60 bucks plus another 20. That's eighty dollars. That's not a gift. That's making merchandise off of God. And that's, that spirit is there wherever that kind of stuff takes place. All right. Now, so we've identified uh, Babylon, uh, a female god, which is a goddess, a spirit. And um, so we, we could safely assume that this spirit has been worshipped under different names or her presence has been known under different names throughout the centuries and according to whatever civilization uh, you're a part of. And it just so happens that I have for you, I've collected uh, a series of images that denote certain goddesses that uh, have been known throughout history. I want you to take a look up at the screen. And the first one you see here, um, the goddess is on the right, the one facing us uh, with this uh, sort of weird headdress. Uh, she has wings, so that is their way of telling you that this is a spirit. Uh, she's got, uh, apparently she's very large size. She has her foot on the back of a lion. And it appears that one of her the worshipers there on the left uh, is, of course, worshiping, or maybe that's a priest of this particular goddess and so on. Uh, this goddess name is Inanna, 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 hey, 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 good, I, I couldn't, couldn't pass that up. Her name is Inanna, okay? She was the goddess of the ancient Sumerians. This goes all the way back to the land of Shinar, which is where the Tower of Babel was, and Nimrod was the king. And Nana could also be seen as, uh, we know that Nimrod uh, had a wife called Semiramis, and uh, she gave birth to a very famous child. We'll look into that in a little bit. Here is another goddess named Anat, you could kind of see the, the similarity in the names Inanna and Anat. It's sort of like uh, the name Ashtaroth, Asherah, Ishtar, and Isis are all similar in names. And I think, this is just me, I think it's because the, the first woman on the earth, Eve, uh, the Hebrew word for her was uh, the, the Hebrew word for the man was ish, and the Hebrew word for the woman was isha. So you have isha, the woman, Isis, the goddess, Ashtaroth, Asherah, and Ishtar. I think they're all related. It's just my guess, but anyway. So this is a knot, and she is seated with Ramesses II. Um, she also, a knot, was consort of Baal, 
that's a name we know from the scriptures. It seems like a not, she's like get around Sue, right? Okay. Uh, this here is Isis. And Isis is holding her newborn baby, the Savior God, by the name of Horus. It was the idea that Osiris was the husband and Isis was the wife. She was, uh, Osiris was the sun god, Isis was the human woman, and they made it together just like Genesis chapter 6 tells us the sons of God came into the daughters of men. A lot of your God slash goddess uh, myths and stories derive directly from the event that took place in Genesis chapter 6. And Genesis 6 says it also took place after the days of the flood. Uh, and there were giants born unto uh, the union of the gods and these females. In some cases, they were then known as goddesses. They were elevated because the gods chose them to be their consort or their wife or sleep partner or paramour or whatever it is. Because the god chose that particular woman, she often then was elevated to the status of goddess such is the case with Isis. She was elevated to the status because Osiris chose her, made it with her, produced the savior god Horus, who was to save the world, but he died. Uh, here's a, other, another rendering of Isis. There she has her wings unfolded, showing that she is now a goddess. Also there, you see Osiris, the sun god, on the left, Isis on the right, and they're both presenting to the world their gift to the world, which was the hybrid between the god and the human woman, Horus. He sort of represents the bridge between heaven and earth. Sound familiar? In fact, some, some people have wrongly concluded that the story of Jesus being the Son of God and the Son of Man, born from the Virgin Mary, uh, it's called some people to, to believe that that story was made up and it follows along the line of other similar stories like Osiris and Isis and Horus. That our religion, Christianity, is no different than any other mystery cult that's ever been on the face of the earth. Well, I, I have a better, I have a better, uh, better understanding, better rendering of that one. See, I think there is a true son of God. His name is Jesus Christ. And I think that the Bible tells us that there will always be another Jesus. And that our Jesus brings good tidings of great joy to all people to the earth so that all people could enjoy eternal life. That's the gospel. And I think all throughout the ages, the thousands of years, there's been another gospel. Okay? There's one true religion and the rest are cheap fakes. And for some reason, most of mankind chooses the cheap fake religion instead of the one true religion, the God who actually loves all of us. Amen. Uh, here's another rendering of Isis. And uh, you notice that she has sort of a crescent moon on her head. She's got her foot on this silvery orb. Uh, we'll see that again in a little bit. Uh, here is a, a goddess called Nut or Nut, maybe. Uh, she is the sky goddess. Notice that her body is made up of stars because these people believe that what covered the earth and covered uh, the sun was this goddess. 
and that she stood over, sort of mound-like, over the earth, and that her body was made up of the stars. Uh, the image you see on the right here is that red disc that's just about to go into her mouth uh, is the idea of what happens to the sun. The sun goes to the west and it ends up in Newt's mouth and she's, yeah, we gotta say it, she swallows it and it goes through her body. <laughs> I didn't make this up. It goes through her body and it comes out some, somewhere, okay? And it's back in the east again and it travels across the earth and goes into her mouth again and it's not my it's not my religion i can tell you that okay but she represents heaven or the heavens okay are you starting to put something together this is uh the greek version of all of these old Egyptian, Sumerian, Canaanite gods and goddesses. Her name was Hera, okay? Uh, probably related to the word hero and so on. Um, the Roman version, or the, yeah, the Roman version, they've always got every Greek god or goddess has got to have a Roman version of this, basically the same thing. You had the Greek empire that took over uh, much of um, Europe and the Middle East and parts of Africa and then of course the Roman Empire conquering that and taking over and way going way beyond where the Greek Empire was the Roman Empire so they adopted a lot of the gods that they have and this is the uh, Roman goddess called Juno uh, here is the ancient Canaanite goddess that we see in the Bible um, in certain places she's called Astarte, but in the Bible her name is Ashtaroth. And again, she's part of uh, what I think, Ashtaroth, uh, Astarte, or Astarte, um, Ishtar, Asherah, and Isis. I think they're all uh, basically uh, etymolo etymolo etymologically related. Did I say that right? Etymology is the study of where words came from, words that I can't pronounce sometimes. But I think that they're all related, and that's Ashtaroth, and again, she's mentioned specifically in the Bible. Now, all of these goddesses that I just showed you, even though they have different names, and they were worshipped in some cases differently uh, across time and across different civilizations, um, you know, a goddess would arise, she would be insignificant for a while, and then all of a sudden, boom, she's the, she's the main goddess and everybody worships her. But then something happens and, they, you know, people lose favor and so they go and they find another one. And, you know, that's, that's the nature of man, is that man is never satisfied with what he has. He always wants something different. You see that in... Uh, the early preaching of the gospel throughout the book of Acts, you had uh, one group called the Bereans, and the Bereans were, were very ready to believe what the apostles were teaching, but they knew that the Bible that they had, which was primarily the Old Testament, they knew and believed it to be the absolute infallible word of God, and they weren't going to stray from it no, not even a degree. So they took everything that the apostles said, and the Bible says these were more noble than any of the others that they preached to, and they searched the scriptures daily to see whether these things were true or not. In other words, everything that Paul and, and, and them taught about the gospel of Jesus Christ and the life of Jesus Christ and his dying on the cross and his resurrection uh, his mediation between God and men, those all had to match up with what they knew in the scriptures. But then you had the Athenians. The Athenians seemed to be more typical of mankind. Mankind uh, goes, I, I knew a family that came to our church years ago, and turns out that they had been members of about four different churches before they ended up in ours 
and I just sort of had it in my mind that they wouldn't be around long, and sure enough, they weren't. I had another family that um, caused some very, very serious harm here at the church, and I asked them to leave, and he had informed me that they had been asked to leave five previous churches, and I, they went to a church, another church in this town, and six months later, the pastor called me and asked me about them. And I said, yeah, I know them. They were going to have to leave that one too. Just tr troublemakers. But people get fickle. They go from one religion to another religion to another religion. Or they go from one denomination to another denomination to another one. Maybe it's that they haven't found the right one yet. Or maybe they're just that way. And that seems to be the way it goes with these goddesses that they're worshipped for a while and they're cast aside. Another one comes along, they worship it. They like it for a while, cast aside. Another civilization, another place in history, and they're worshipping essentially the same goddess, just under different names, different, um, maybe certain different characteristics. But one thing usually remains the same. And that is that every one of these goddesses that I just showed you have borne the title of the Queen of Heaven. Now, if that phrase sounds familiar to you, it could be for one of two reasons or both reasons at the same time. Number one, you know that you've read that phrase in the Bible. And you have, maybe, hopefully. Also, it means that you have seen that name um, across the, the sign of a particular Catholic church. Mary, Queen of Heaven, Catholic Church. Mary has a lot of different titles, and then maybe in the next... Watchmen we do on this subject will go into some of those titles, but one of the main aspects uh, that the Catholics place upon Mary, one of the different titles, uh, the different uh, responsibilities, or whatever it is, they call her the Queen of Heaven. Now, uh, and, and of course, here she is, and, and I can tell you, there is no lacking of paintings, sculptures, drawings, you name it, of Mary being crowned Queen of Heaven by God, I guess, uh, on one side. Look at this picture here. God on one side, and I'm assuming that that's Jesus on the other, and I'm assuming that dove there is the Holy Spirit, and they're all three placing this crown upon Mary's head with all of these angels in adoration to her, all of these men who are dressed like monks that are all adoring her as the Queen of Heaven. Now, let me, let me just share something with you that uh, I don't know if you've ever noticed this or not. Let's, let's go back and look at this, at this painting, okay? Do you see in this artwork anybody's name written out, you know, like across their, their chest or, you know, maybe a, like on, at their feet or something like that? Is there anything in this painting that names any of these characters in this painting? The answer is no. And... I would, I've looked at lots and lots and lots of paintings, Catholic paintings and so on. And just by looking at them, we are to assume that the man here on the left is Jesus. But it doesn't say that it's Jesus. That this figure on the right holding, you know, this orb and and he's in regal robes, and he's got a long white beard, and we assume that that's God. But it's not written on here. And 
no description of God anywhere in the Bible tells us 100% for sure that that's God. The Holy Spirit as a dove, okay, yeah, we have that one in the Bible. But doves are also symbols in other religions of other things. Birds themselves. Remember Babylon? And then, of course, this woman. Okay, and she's like that in a lot of paintings. We're assuming that that's the Virgin Mary, and we're assuming that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are bringing in a fourth person to the Trinity, and that is Mary, the Queen of Heaven. Here's the problem. Since we don't have any identification cards on the painting itself, um, Jesus is not wearing a tattoo saying, what would I do? Okay, nothing like that. Um, that is kind of funny. Um, and since we don't have not one verse of Scripture, not even part of a verse of Scripture, not one shred of evidence telling us that when Mary died and when her soul uh, rose up to heaven that when she got there she discovered that all the angels were waiting in adoration and God the Father was waiting there with a specially built crown for her and he had her sit down and all of heaven attended the coronation of Mary as the Queen of Heaven. We don't have one verse of Scripture. In fact, basically here's the, the, the sum of the knowledge from the Bible that we have about Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ. We know that God uh, specifically chose her, uh, a woman, who, a young woman who was a virgin, and uh, we know that uh, she was the cousin to uh, Elizabeth. We know that, um, that Mary was, was present at the first miracle that Jesus did. And she said to those who were at the party, uh, the wedding party, she said, what, what's over he tells you to do, you do. And then we know that uh, she was at the scene of the cross when Jesus was crucified because Jesus said to her, Woman, behold thy son. And she was referring, he was referring to John. John, behold thy mother. And basically, uh, Jesus was giving John uh, custodianship of Mary. In other words, Mary, John's going to take care of you now that I'm gone. Um, and you know he'll 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 be a good one okay he'll be a good son to you you'll be like his mother and he'll take good care of you until you die we know that mary was there present in the upper room when the holy ghost was poured out upon the 120 that were there uh the the 12 disciples and um as of that point we have no other mention of Mary whatsoever. If, if you were told in the Catholic Church, if you were told in some class or by some priest that the Bible teaches you that Mary, um, I can't quite figure out if, if they say that she ever died or just fell asleep, but if they tell you that instantly body and soul of Mary was taken by angels into heaven, well, that's just not in the Bible anywhere. It's not in any of the uh, any of the writings of the days that the Bible was being written, between um, oh, we would assume between like around A.D. 35 to somewhere around A.D. 100. 
that pretty much covers the, the life and times of the 12 disciples, John being the last one, dying somewhere around A.D. 93, 94, somewhere around in there. Um, no, no, none of the writings from that time period give us any indication that Mary was taken bodily and soul directly up into heaven and was thus crowned as queen of heaven. Nothing. Not one word. And yet, that now has become one of the most important doctrines of the Catholic faith. You would think now that something as important as Mary being called and crowned the Queen of Heaven would have some basis in Scripture. And yet, well, let me say that it does. There is a mentioning in the Old Testament of a Queen of Heaven. But in the mentioning of the Queen of Heaven, God is not happy about it at all. And we'll get into that as we move along. Let's do a little comparison here of some of these goddesses that we saw being named as Queen of Heaven along with the Virgin Mary. Let's compare um, how they were looked at, how they were seen, how they were worshipped with how Mary is worshipped and um, seen now uh, amongst Catholic scholars and Catholic believers. Here is Inanna once again. And uh, I, I, I couldn't help it. I've been telling you that there is a place on the internet called ChatGPT where you can go and ask artificial intelligence a question and it'll give you a pretty dead-on reasonable answer. And it's written in human English, English that we would understand, not in some computer printout, but it's like somebody wrote the answer and sent it to you. So I asked the computer uh, to show me or share with me comparisons between how the Queen of Heaven was worshipped in ancient times and how the Virgin Mary is worshipped as Queen of Heaven in the Catholic Church. Here's one of the things that it came up with. Um, both were revered as powerful female figures who were believed, get, here we go now, who were believed to intercede on behalf of their followers and offer protection and guidance. Now, a computer answered that question. And I can tell you that after doing the study myself, if you study Inanna, if you study these other goddesses I mentioned, that's what you're going to find. You're going to find that the way Inanna was seen by her followers is exactly the same way that the Virgin Mary is seen by the followers of Catholicism. That both of them revere her as a powerful female figure, a goddess, and both Inanna and Mary are seen as those who intercede on behalf of those who pray to her, those who adore her, those who venerate her, those who worship her, those who give offerings to her and burn incense to her, and that Mary will always provide guidance and protection to those who dedicate their heart, their body, their soul, everything over to Mary. And, and I have to tell you, if I were to, if I were, if, let's say that somebody came to this planet who didn't know anything about our religions and they were to get, sort of survey Roman Catholicism, would they, would they say that Roman Catholicism is the worship of a male god that has sort of a female goddess tagging along behind? Or would they literally see that the Catholic Church itself is 100% completely devoted to Mary, the Queen of Heaven, and that God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, they're, they're sort of like aids 
to the powers of Mary. And I would say that more than likely, someone who wouldn't know anything about earth religions coming here would say, it just seems like the Catholic Church, they point more toward Mary than to do anybody else up in heaven. And I would have to agree with them. How many popes in our age, our lifetime, have spent a majority of their life and ministry dedicated to the Virgin Mary? John Paul II was crazy about her. He actually believed that the Virgin Mary performed the miracle on him by that bullet diverting itself inside his body. It should have killed him, but it didn't. And he spent the rest of his papacy pushing Mary. In fact, his coat of arms has the typical cross on it and has the letter M. Let me show you something. The letter M put there in, inside the cross, meaning Mary. If we were to count A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M. M is the 13th letter of the alphabet. This phrase here in Revelation 17, Mystery Babylon the Great, the Mother of Harlots and Abominations of the Earth, 13 words here. Okay? And I don't have time to get into it today. There is a connection. All right? In fact, Inanna's main symbol, going back to Inanna and, and the relationship between Inanna and Mary. Inanna, if you look here on the left, notice above her head is an eight pointed star. That was her symbol. In other words, the Sumerians, whenever they rendered her in some form of, of carving or brass thing or whatever, they always put the eight pointed star. Now that caught my attention because just the last time we were together, I noted that right above the papal altar in St. Peter's Basilica, is a collection of 32 stars and they, every one of them, are eight pointed stars. Now is that an airtight connection that we have that proves? No, but it, it seems to be more than coincidental, alright? Seems to have a purpose. Um, then we have a, a rendering of what may be Inanna, um, the ancient Sumerian goddess. And here she is holding, you can see there on the left, she's holding uh, a little person. That would be her baby. Okay, The baby's name was uh, Demuzid. We know it in, from the Bible as Temuz. And in almost every painting of Mary and Jesus. In fact, go to Google Images and type in Mary and Jesus. Almost without fail, it's going to be a painting of an adult Mary holding the little baby Jesus. Now, ask the question, who is the most in these, all of these thousands of paintings, who seems to be the most significant person in those paintings? And you can't say it's Jesus. Because Jesus is always a baby. And we know that there was nothing in the Bible about Jesus doing some great miracle as a baby. Okay? He didn't heal people. He didn't talk in tongues. He didn't uh, raise people from the dead. He didn't order lightning strikes from heaven. Nothing like that when he was a baby. Those paintings, almost without fail, 100% completely devoted to Mary as being the one responsible for Jesus. In fact, it's almost like saying, well, if we didn't have Mary, we would never have Jesus. So it's that sort of argument that says, Mary's the superior one here. Mary, Mary is the most important thing here. Because without Mary, we wouldn't have Jesus. Well, I'm here to tell you that whether it was Mary or some other gal, God would have found a way. Okay? And 
the whole of the New Testament and the whole of the Bible is all pointed in the direction of one person, and it's not Mary. It is Jesus Christ. Back at these comparisons again, I've mentioned that this child, Demuzid, also goes by the name of Tammuz. Now, Tammuz is mentioned in the Bible. Because Tammuz is it's sort of like Horus. Remember, you had Osiris, you had Isis, and you had Horus there, their, their love child there in the middle, and he's supposed to be the savior god. Well, Horus represents what is known as the dying God. In fact, there is an article on Wikipedia about this. Uh, Manley Hall uh, talks about it in The Secret Teachings of All Ages. And he talks about this dying God that you can see all throughout history in different civilizations, how there was always a, a God type person or a demigod, half human, half God, that was born to save mankind or born to save uh, these particular people and he was killed by some evil people and they're awaiting him uh, they're awaiting his return when he comes back to life Quetzalcoatl Quetzalcoatl was the dying god who died on sort of a cross thing and so when um, the first Aztecs see Hernando Cortez uh, coming off the, the boats there with this cross, and it's got this Jesus on the cross, this bearded because Quetzalcoatl was pictured as this white bearded giant guy. They went running to Montezuma and said, Quetzalcoatl's back. Quetzalcoatl's here. And that's why Montezuma received with open arms Cortez, who then had them all killed. That didn't work out so well, did it? Well, Tammuz is mentioned in the Bible because there is, there is always a time of mourning in their religions, whether it was uh, Horus or whether it was Quetzalcoatl or whether it was Tammuz. There's always this time, usually 40 days were spent by women who were going through this ritualistic religious mourning thing for their dying God. And God knew, our God, the God of the Bible knew that they were doing it at the temple of God in Jerusalem. And he took Ezekiel on a little trip to see what was going on behind all the closed doors in the temple. And this is what the Bible says, Ezekiel 8, 13. He said also unto me, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Temuz, 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 Demuzid, whatever. And so I'm, I pointed out to you the last time this carving that's in St. Peter's Basilica. And again, it has no nameplates on it. It doesn't have uh, anybody wearing a wristband with their name on it, no tattoos, nothing. And it's simply called Paeta, which means pity. And what you see is a woman holding the dead body of what we're told is her dead son. And again, I ask the question, since there's nothing here that identifies who these people are, how do we know that that's really supposed to be Jesus and that that's really Mary? Because if we were to compare Mary's facial features in this carving with other paintings of Mary, they all look different. Every one of them looks different. So we're just to assume that that's Mary, and we're to assume it's Jesus, even though God said, since you saw no uh, likeness of me, you saw no similitude of me, nothing that looked like me uh, there at Mount Sinai, you can't carve an image and say, that's God 
because you don't know what I look like. And that, to us, is very important. If some woman come up to me just out of the blue, and I'd never seen her before, and she says, come on, hon, let's go home. What are you, crazy? Mike, it's me, your wife, Lisa. No, you're not. Uh-huh. And she pulls out like 100 pictures, and all 100 pictures are of me with a different woman, which doesn't exist, by the way. Yeah, I'm your, I'm your wife here, I'm your wife here, I'm your wife here. I'm your, you see what I'm getting at? No way can we ever actually identify the people in these paintings and in these sculptors. And yet we're supposed to believe that that's Mary and that that's Jesus and that that's Peter, that's Paul. That's, that's uh, uh, in fact, every Catholic church, every single Catholic church by canon law has to have a statue of Joseph, a statue of Mary, and a crucifix of Jesus. And how many of those statues of Joseph are exactly identical? None. Statues of Mary, exactly identical. Same facial features, everything. None. None of them. We don't even, we don't even know what Jesus looked like. Other than the description that John has in the book of Revelation. We have no idea what he looks like. And we're told that that's supposed to be who that is. I'm not buying it. Now, here is the Wikipedia article on what they refer to as the biblical basis of why Mary is now absolutely 100% established as the Queen of Heaven. Okay? And to say that they went way out on a limb to get this one is an understatement. Okay, let's read what they said. In the Hebrew Bible, some Davidic kings, in other words, David and his heirs to the throne, had in their court a Gebira, which means great lady. Now stop right here. Lady is a term that is often given to Mary, our lady, or the lady of Guadalupe, or the lady, our lady of sorrows, our lady of this, our lady of that. Lady is the opposite term to Lord. You follow me? So if someone is called Lord, we have one Lord, and that is Jesus. Okay? And does the Bible mention anything about a lady? It does. We'll get there. Okay? But the, understand that that's what the term means when it says great lady. She's the opposite of who a Lord would be, which means she has great authority. The Gabira, who was often their mother, but not always. And held great power as his advisor and an advocate to him. Now, whoever wrote this is really trying to lay it on you. They're trying to make you think that behind every king was this overpowering mother who said, son, you're going to do this or else I'm your mother. Sort of like that. Uh, in 1 Kings 2.20, Solomon said to his mother, Bathsheba, seat, seated on a throne at his right, make your request, mother, for I will not refuse you. Uh, William G. Most sees here a sort of type of Mary. Now that's pretty, that's pretty uh, explicit language. William G. Most sees here a sort of a type of a Mary. That's not being very accurate, is it? And a type basically is a foreshadowing, like in literature you have a foreshadowing of an event that happens near the end of the book and so on. Um, but remember, Solomon went to Bathsheba, his mother, and said, Mother, just out of honor to you, uh, I'll, I'll grant you any, any request that you want. And basically she gave him one thing and he said, okay, I'll do that. But other than that, we don't have any other record of Solomon who was practically the greatest king of all Israel getting orders 
from his mother or his mother constantly coming to him saying, son, why don't you do this? Son, why don't you go this way? Son, won't you marry these 700 women? Son, why don't... Nothing like that. Not one thing. And we certainly don't have in any of the gospel accounts of Jesus Christ, Jesus following orders from his mother. And that's basically the theology behind Mary, is that Mary is the one who takes our requests as we pray to her, and she takes them to Jesus and says, Jesus, I'm your mother now. You have to do this. Priests have explained it like, wouldn't you do what your mother asked you to do? So therefore, Jesus does what his mother asked him to do. And that's garbage. No such title or authority ever given to Mary or any other woman, for that matter, in the Bible. None. Okay? But since they brought up this uh, Gebira, the great lady, being the mother of a king, let's actually pull a story from the Bible and find out that the king was in no way um, ordered or uh, mandated by law that he had to listen to what his mother said or he had to follow the directions of his mother or that he had to allow his mother, if she was wicked, to remain being the queen. First Kings chapter 15. And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. And he took away the Sodomites out of the land and removed all... If, if Asa was king in the Vatican right now, how many priests would be left in the Vatican if Asa took away all the Sodomites? Uh, he took away all the Sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols... If, if Asa was the king in the Vatican right now, how many statues would be left? <laughs> Not one. He removed all the idols that his father had made. And also Maaka, his mother, even her, he removed from being queen. Because she had made an idol in a grove. <laughs> you know what that is, right? The idol in a grove was usually the goddess, the fertility goddess, the queen of heaven, who is always surrounded by bushes and roses and flowers and all kinds of things. Still going on today. So if Asa was the king right now in the Vatican, he would have eliminated, number one, every priest that was homosexual. Number two, he would have removed every idol in every Catholic church around the world. And then he would have said of this so-called queen of heaven, we're not having it. You're putting up images of this queen of heaven, this goddess, inside these groves. I want them all destroyed every one of them. So can, you can imagine the shrine at Fatima, the shrine at Lourdes, the shrine at Guadalupe, all the uh, Marian apparitions that have you know, happened all throughout the last several hundred years, and all these Mary, Queen of Heaven Catholic churches. If Asa was king in the Vatican now, it would be a much different church, wouldn't it? Anyway, he, anyway, because she had made an idol in a grove and Asa destroyed her idol and burned it by the brook Kidron. And then he said to his own mother, get out. You're not going to make a mockery of my God while I'm king. Well, we need some more. We need some more popes like that. We need some more preachers like that. Amen.